Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing drug addiction and drug dependencies and how to support people living with those addictions with guests. Jeremy Klemensky, President and CEO of Helio Health in New York, and Dale Klatsker, CEO of Gardenzia Incorporated in Pennsylvania. Jeremy Dale, thank you so much for, for coming in to join us. A really important discussion. I'm going to uh, set you up and, and uh, I'm going to go to you, Jeremy, first. But just sort of to, to set the stage, we have over 19 million people in the, U, in the United States live with alcohol and drug addiction, also known as, known as substance use disorders. And they're, you know, they're our family, our friends, our coworkers, they're our neighbors. And those who pass on the street, everybody is affected by, by this issue. And we're here to look at how uh, we tackle the problem, a problem that is so often denied, um, and a problem that is linked to genetics, trauma, lifestyle, environmental factors, mental health challenges, and a whole range of other causes. That's not just one thing. So, uh, Jeremy, just sort of starting from a view in, in New York, uh, how do you see the addiction the challenges that we face in our society. What does the problem look like from your seat? Thank you, Mark, uh, for having me today. The, the problem that we see, uh, especially in New York, is that, uh, first of all, the substance use, uh, misuse, dependency, uh, it can affect anyone. Uh, so when we talk about what it looks like, literally, uh, it, it looks like any one of us, frankly. Um, and, 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 and the reason for that is that a lot of times uh, substance use uh, originates as a result of some form of trauma, whether it's a physical trauma, an injury uh, at work, an injury playing sports, an injury uh, working out, or some sort of uh, psychological and mental trauma that happens to a person throughout their lifetime. And those traumas, uh, the untreated ones, sometimes lead to uh, what people will refer to as self-medication, uh, but seeking things that alleviate the suffering and pain that they're experiencing. Uh, the physical traumas, uh, especially in the last you know, 15 plus years uh, in the United States, oftentimes led to uh, someone being prescribed into addiction, if you will. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, the ongoing litigation around uh, the behavior of certain pharma organizations. And, and the mislabeling and the misrepresentation of how addictive certain medications were that were being prescribed. I so think medications of, marketed as, as completely be be benign and harmless until after the fact we have an opioid crisis that is just unfreaking believable. You, you got it. I mean, so, so what we see uh, in New York is that um, we see all types of people walking through our doors. We see people, uh, younger folks, older folks. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any specific uh, age range or, or social group that is... White, uh, black, Latino, people with glasses, male, female, young, old, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's hitting, it, it's hitting the, whole, the whole gamut, isn't it, Dale? It, it is, and um, <clears throat> to add to what Jeremy's talking about, um, this is a brain disease. While in and of itself, uh, your genetics has a role in this, <clears throat> it's often the triggers on top of the proclivity or the genetic disposition that push people into this situation. And, you know, it's not an accident that overdoses have increased so dramatically during COVID. Um, because I can't think of another time in my lifetime where there's been so much external triggering <laughs> to what might be an internal uh, uh, genetic disposition. Um, you know, we, we are a mid-Atlantic provider. We are based in Pennsylvania, but we are the largest provider in Pennsylvania, in Maryland. We have services in Delaware and in Washington, D.C., Sadly, all of our states and the district are in the top 10 in terms of overdose uh, per capita uh, rates. Um, and these things are only going higher. We are, it, it's not an issue of money. It is more an issue of understanding and addressing what has long been stigmatized and seen as a moral behavior as opposed to a medical uh, condition. So, uh, Jeremy, do you endorse this idea that it's not a moral issue, that it's not a matter of character weakness or character flaw or, uh, you know, a, a, 
a uh, somehow a, a lack of of strength or moral or morals or whatever. Do you endorse this this idea? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, what we've seen in our work is that no no person. Uh, wakes up and says, you know, I'm going to engage in, in behaviors that are going to eventually cost me my relationships, cost me my employment, uh, cost, cost me my life. Uh, people don't make that. That's not a choice that uh, uh, people make. What we, what we see is that a lot of people, uh, you know, don't even know the impact of the substances they're taking. They're oftentimes, I mean, I'll give you a profile, uh, children who experience a trauma that goes untra- undiagnosed, untreated, uh, you know, we see those folks ending up uh, experiencing uh, substance use and eventually dependency addiction. Um, adults who've been injured in the workplace uh, who are prescribed a medication and, and become then dependent on that medication, then that medication is taken away from them, but their body is still dependent on it. Their brain is still chemically dependent on that substance. And without proper uh, treatment to alleviate that, this, this that brain disease, uh, you know, that Dale mentioned, um, what, what do we expect them to do? Well, we would expect them to do exactly what the average person does, which is seek to substitute good, which in this case is an illicit substance off the street. Um, th- this is not a, a moral issue. The moral issue with addiction is the way we've handled it as a society. Um, it is true that decades ago, we didn't have the science to fully appreciate the disorder uh, and its chronic progressive nature that leads to you know, eventually a fatal state. Um, but we do have that science now. I mean, we literally have brain images that can show us what happens in, in, in portions of the brain when impacted by substance. We have the science now. As a society, we're becoming increasingly enlightened about that science. And, and once we have that knowledge, once we are no longer ignorant as people about the, the disorders, then we have an obligation to have empathy for people experiencing them. And I would say this, it is no different, and it, it, it shouldn't be any different than the way we respond when we hear that somebody has been diagnosed with cancer. When someone's diagnosed with cancer, what happens? Everybody rallies around. We have bake sales and fundraisers, and we offer to cook meals for somebody when they're in chemo. That's the response that our society and our social networks should be performing for somebody who we learn is experiencing a substance use disorder. Because frankly, those supports, that love and the encouragement will go a long way to helping people recover. Um, I, um, I totally agree with, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I totally agree with, with Jeremy. And, and again, tell me something else in our, in our health world that, that's equivalent to this. There are, uh, we don't deal with heart disease this way. We don't deal with cancer this way. We have not dealt with COVID this way. More people, other than those three areas, addiction deaths from alcohol and uh, opioids and and, uh, the the, uh, other elements of that, all of those exceed every other cause of death in the United States. We attribute, we don't fund it the same way, and we attribute the illness to the person, but we don't with anything else that has had this amount of impact. There, this is not a simple thing. We don't research it. We don't act. We don't. You know, we 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 um, silo healthcare and silo our responses and blame the victim in this particular case. So, basically, what you're both advocating is is a different a soup to nuts different way of considering, a more intricative way of considering um, this this condition, likening it as you did, uh, Jeremy, to cancer or as heart diseases, as you suggested, uh, Dale, that you can actually see the onset. The onset can be detected. We can actually see that somebody uh, might be short of breath right, in a, in a heart situation, or that they're experiencing some pains that just do not look right or feel right, right? And, and when somebody um, is experiencing um, a, a descent into opioid addiction or alcoholism or gambling addiction or other types of addictions, we can actually see it. We, sh- we should be responding. So let's talk a little bit about that early piece, right? How can we help? Because very often, 
if you're self-medicating, you're doing it to relieve trauma, as you said, Jeremy, it, it, it so often is dealt with. So it might be seemingly the best choice initially until it isn't the best choice. Um, how do we, how do we, Dale, do you want to, you want to jump in first? And Yeah. I mean, I, in my career, I've worked in a variety of healthcare settings, including hospital systems and a lot with primary care. And even to this day, when you go to a primary care doctor, if he or she diagnoses you with a heart ailment or wants to check that out or believes you have cancer, you're immediately uh, addressed. You're immediately sent to a specialist, especially you're not denied access. Uh, you're not denied care. With addiction, if you, first of all, it's more likely than not that when you go to your primary care doctor, they won't ask you whether you have whether you're depressed, whether you are abusing drugs or using drugs, regardless of the situation. I'm and in pain. They, here's, here's another prescription. Right. And if they do, they don't know where to send you because there is no fluid, free-flowing, well-connected, well-integrated set of services that you can access to address it. So we ignore it rather than address it. So to, to your question, the earlier you address the issue, the earlier you get people the, the help they need, the skills they need, the supports they need, the connections they need. Oh, and by the way, this is about social determinants of health. You know, not everybody has a roof over their head. Not everybody has an education. Not everybody has a career. Not everybody has insurance. So if, if, if Jeremy's point about trauma is, is correct, and we're, we're in the midst of a poll in which we asked, you know, what are the roots of addiction? And we, we said education level, environmental factors like family peer pressure uh, and so on, uh, genetics, lifestyle and personal choice, mental health issues and so on. If the unifying factor is some sort of trauma, um, either trauma um, in, in terms of genetic composition or trauma in terms of experience, right? Then if we, all, if we all are going to periodically suffer that and the social determinants of health means that certain populations are going to experience more trauma, and if Jeremy's right that trauma is the unifying uh, factor, then of course there's going to be more addiction in those, in those populations. Is that, is that about right? I would say it is. I mean, I do business in Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, big, large urban environments where um, where these things are exacerbated, where, where there's a, a degree of hopelessness and helplessness that we have developed <laughs> in each of these environments. And it just makes the the fundamental medical issues that we're talking about, let alone the life issues, so much harder. And, and some to give you put some some uh, more support around what what Dale just said. We operate in smaller upstate New York cities, Syracuse, Binghamton, Rochester, Utica, um, but we serve the folks who live in the more rural surrounding counties who come into those cities, and in some cases we go out into their community with mobile services things, and we see the same thing. We see it affecting people. Uh, yes, who have uh, less supports from a social determinants of health, but we also see it in, in the more rural communities. Uh, we see people who work on a farm who were injured. We see people who work on a farm uh, who may have also been traumatized by something that happened to them uh, at school or at some other social institution or from a family member. Um, those, those things are unifying across uh, settings. Um, and so I think, uh, I think it's true uh, that uh, poverty, uh, that housing, uh, that access to good food and nutrition, all of those things play a role. But those those issues are present uh, in, in all settings in, in, in the country. Um, and, and to give you some perspective, um, you know, let's let's take a wealthy home, right, where there's lots of food and there's good housing and there's good medical care and all those things are there. Maybe there's parents, maybe there's even a nanny, maybe there's all kinds of supports. Well, those folks are still uh, able to be experience trauma psychologically, be abused by somebody, have an injury or be in a car accident or, or fall off their bike and have a head injury. I mean, all of those things are still there. So, so whether it's a physical trauma, it's a psychological trauma, I do think it's true that in certain settings, uh, the likelihood of experiencing those traumas is enhanced. 
but those traumas do still occur, even in settings with more protective factors. And that's why I, I advocate very strongly uh, for people refer to screening, uh, brief intervention and referral to treatment to consider a national best practice. Um, but, but we should be screening people at every healthcare setting for uh, mental psychological trauma, just like we do for physical trauma. And we should be documenting that in a person's patient record. And then we should be following up on it, right? As a person gets older. So for example, when a child is younger, um, the child may not be able to verbalize the trauma, but the parent or the caregiver might. And we could document it in the person's care record, right? And then as they get older, we could follow up with the child and find out how that is affecting them. Because sometimes these things don't manifest until someone's much older. And I'll give you a, 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 an example uh, case, case that I'm familiar with. Child was traumatized uh, at a younger age, um, didn't even understand the trauma until they were older, um, got involved with the criminal justice system, and then referred the child uh, to uh, be evaluated. Um, it turns out that the reason that child started using substances at the age they did was because that's when they first had access to them. And when they used those substances, it was the only time that child didn't experience the mental pain that they did from the trauma they experienced as a child that they didn't know how to uh, understand or process. And so they developed a dependency. So no, sometimes a, these I things a, progress at a different path. I have a personal story that is, that is, uh, that is interesting. My great grandfather was, was addicted to gambling and almost ruined the family. My grandfather um, was, was in the process of helping um, that to recover. What happened in Germany uh, took place in the Second World War. They became refugees. My grandfather was unable to process his emotions. I mean, he, he was evidently very buttoned down and it just aided him and aided him and aided him. And he died of a massive heart attack at 50 but having successfully with my grandmother created a life here in this country, right? This, this, this whole idea of, of this cycle of trauma and he kept cycling through the same experience, the same experience. He was, he was so buttoned down. He was sort of addicted to cycling through that experience that it, it ended up taking a physical toll. And now it could have been a leap through, through drugs or through alcohol or whatever um, that, that other people take. But this whole idea of, we're all in this process. Uh, Dale, you had, you had said it's a disease of the mind. It is a disease of the mind. So how do we, how do we treat? Let's, let, let's inflect now from talking about the issues that we have, the fact that we don't have a continuum of care that is smooth, the transition from, as you said, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy uh, getting, um, getting a checkup, but also including these kinds of issues. Um, how do we change? How do we act? How, what what kind of of um, of work can we be doing to make it better in a systematic way? Dale, you okay. want to do a first cut? What I would say is um, we need to understand that this is not just again a moral failing. It's not just a one-off situation. This is a uh, a brain disease, a chronic illness, and we need to treat it as such. So we have a delivery system, a health human services delivery system that is set up for an acute, almost exactly set, entirely set up for a one and done kind of environment, an acute episodic intervention. That isn't gonna work when you have a chronic uh, genetic, uh, but trauma related uh, um, illness, it's going to take considerable interventions, um, medically, psychologically, um, physically, uh, uh, economically, in order to help people recover. Now, we have so lots made, of good examples of people there. who do recover. I'm sorry. You, you've made three points there. First of all, you've said, let's change our attitude. Let's change our analysis of the issue, right? right. The second thing you said is, get rid of the stigma. It's just nonsense. There's no stigma, right? And the third thing that you said, right, right in that, that very short uh, exposition, the third thing you said is, is let's have a much more rational, integrative approach to, 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 to health. I'm sorry I cut you off, but you just said 
like three amazing things in two sentences. It was just, <laughs> just phenomenal. I wanted to call them out. Jeremy, do you want to add to, to, uh, to this in terms of how we should look at treating this, this problem, dealing with it? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a mind shift that has to occur uh, nationally, in, in, in not just with policymakers, lawmakers, funders, insurers, um, but as individual citizens. As we've become more educated about substance use, as we develop empathy as a result of that education, we then have to move to action. And the move to action that I think is necessary is moving away from a, a mindset where we, we fund things based on what can we get away with, okay? We, we tend to, in our, in our society, fund addiction on a level of, uh, well, what, what, what's the minimum necessary? That's what tends to happen. What we should be asking, the question we should be asking is, what resources would, should we put into play to build a system that would help people reach their full potential? Okay, when we talk about um, different justice issues, for example, um, a lot of people experience trauma uh, through no fault of their own, right? Car accidents, workplace injuries, being victimized by somebody else. Well, as a society, we have to embrace that when that goes untreated, it costs our society a lot. It isn't just the suffering of that person. A lot of the people that experience uh, substance use disorders and frankly, mental health disorders, they suffer in silence. We don't see it. It's not as obvious as when you drive by a car crash on the highway, for example. But those people are suffering. They're suffering and they may not be able to express it. As a society, when we embrace that we should commit the resources to helping those folks no longer be suffering in silence so that they can lead fuller, more productive lives, we will get a return on that investment. We'll get a return because they will be able to be more active participants in supporting their families. They'll be able to rejoin the workforce because people in recovery, you know, it's, it's something that people don't emphasize enough. There are an awful lot of people who are living in recovery that are living incredibly productive lives, contributing a tremendous amount to our society. And, and we don't talk about it enough, but I am of the belief because I've seen it in my work that when we invest in those services, I believe the return on every dollar spent is several multiples of that dollar, not just an increased tax revenue, but increased social health, um, increased family supports, and, and then the, le the decreased likelihood. I mean, let's think about the, the national addiction uh, overdose numbers right now, right? We just saw a report in the last two weeks that said that we had over 100,000 fatal overdoses in this country. Okay, that is 100,000 families and social networks that have been traumatized by the loss of somebody they care about. And then you multiply that by people who did not pass away through overdose, right? You multiply with the extended suffering of, of those families in, in advance of that event, right? I mean, this is just 100,000 is such an under an underrepresentation of the true impact um, of, of these conditions. And to a certain extent, in the opioid uh, sense, in, in a liquor store on every corner, we're, we're creating the problem that we are now trying to fund um, programs to heal. It's, it, it's kind of stunning. But we can't just say, we're not going to have any opioids, right? Mm -hmm. We can't say to people, you're not allowed to have alcohol. We can't say that. So we're kind of living with this. If people are addicted to food, we can't shut off food, right? So is what you're saying, uh, Jeremy, is that we have to sort of integrate into our attitudes consideration of these issues as part of the human experience? Yeah, what, what I'm advocating for is we, we have to be willing as a society to not see this as just another thing we have to pay for. We need to see this as an investment in people's health, as an investment in social equity, as an investment in people having an opportunity at a richer life. And what we have to do is ask ourselves, if I was the person in that, in that condition, if I was the person going through that, would I want those resources or not? 
So right now I might be today, I might be the person uh, who's, who, who seemingly has a, a good situation. I've got good income. I've got a stable family. I have good health insurance. I have a lot of great resources available to me. But, but what if I experience a trauma tomorrow? What if, what if I'm hit by a car crossing the street? What if I become dependent on the substances that are used to treat my pain during that process? And what if a few years from now, I've lost my job and I've lost some of my familial connections and I've lost my insurance and, and, and I'm the person that no longer has housing and I'm the person that no longer has all the supports that I once had. Would I want those resources to be available to me? Yes, I would. And I also want them for every other person that is in that condition today, because I know that they didn't do anything that caused them to be there. Right. They are there largely through no fault of their own because of things that they experienced or things that they didn't have available to them as protective factors when they came into this world. And as a result, I think we have an obligation to support them and invest in them. And, and if a person doesn't care about their fellow uh, man or woman in that way, I would simply say to you, it's good economics as well. We yeah, get a, we get a good you, return. We're going to give you the last word. Um, I want to I want to ask you something just sort of from the heart of your programs. We asked a question in terms of finding a, a permanent solution. We said, who has primary ethical and financial responsibility to help solve the epi epidemic of substance use and addiction? And we we, we mentioned uh, churches, companies, right, businesses, family and friends, government, individuals, nonprofits, and so on. You have a really robust set of programs. Could you give your take not only on, on who is responsible within our society, but also how that can get articulated through uh, programmatic efforts? Um, and, and we're coming to the end, so you're going to have the last word, but it would just be great for you to give us a sense of, of those two areas. Who's responsible and what kind of responses you provide as kind of a model for our behavior? Well, I, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a difficult question to answer in a couple of seconds, but um, we all have responsibility. I don't like forced choices. Um, it, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a mind, a, a, a way of looking at people differently than we do now. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we need to look at this holistically. As a provider, as creating a provider system, a large system, we need to look at this holistically. Me, we need, I we, have to do that. You, everybody, right? If I everybody business, has to look at it holistically, everybody has to address and not be afraid to indicate that this is a pervasive, it's a equal opportunity set of, of issues and, and problems. You know, I happen to, I have voted for Biden. Biden has one child who died of brain cancer. He talked a lot about that. He's got another child who has an addiction disorder. He's talked about it, but it's not a politically favorable thing to talk about. The stigma, the, the, the blaming is so pervasive that it freezes a lot of the rest of this. And from Trump's perhaps, brother, Trump's elder brother died of an addiction as well, right? So what right. Your, your point is, it doesn't matter. Politics is, is nonsense in this, right. in this issue. So we need to drop all that pretense and, and uh, uh, preachiness. But from a systems perspective, we need to understand that it's not a unique service that's going to make a difference. It's, it's all services working in a collaborative way. It's prevention, it's uh, short-term treatment, it's long-term treatment, it's outpatient treatment, it's medicated-assisted uh, therapies, it's recovery supports, it's primary care, it's housing, it's- It's a families, universe. it's churches, it's, right. it's, it's having, as Jeremy said, it's having a vehicle to get out to those rural areas. Right in order to provide those, those kind, so all of these different elements are part of the solution. It's really an integrative approach. Thank you so much, uh, both of you for sharing. It's been a short discussion, but just a wonderful one, full of content. Uh, thank you, Jeremy Klemensky, President and CEO of Helio Health in New York, and Dale Klatsker, CEO of Gardenzia Incorporated in Pennsylvania, serving a whole region. It's just it's just wonderful to get access to your knowledge 
And if there's one takeaway, it's that we need to change our, our mindset and look at this as just part of, of the lives of our families, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, and, and those people we pass by on the street. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care.